Excellent, Jeff. So um, I think in the winter we had Sarah Scotchville come and speak to us the first time. She was a huge hit, and because of that, we were lucky enough to fit into her schedule again. So we are more than delighted to welcome back to us Sarah Scotchville. She's a minister. Oh, I like these ones, though. Well, you can have both. Yeah. She is um, an interim minister at the Unitarian Universalist Church in Eugene and made the trip over to come see us and talk with us today. So please help me welcome Sarah back. It is so hard to believe it's been six months since I saw you all. But you've been on my mind. I've been secretly keeping up with your ongoing plans and I'm so excited for you all. I often think of church as being a house of hope and memory. It's a place where we hold the memories of where we've been and who we are, which this year is so important for you all, as you've lost your founder. And we also hold the hope of the future and where we're going. And we hold those two things simultaneously. And I wanted to talk to you today about the sacredness of memory. We have both a communal memory as a community that anyone can enter into the stream of, but each of us holds our own dear memories unknown to others. And I think that in a religious community, it's possible for us to honor and revere that private source of memory in each of us. Now for me, I've been reminiscing about this book that I enjoyed as a child called Acts of God. Now there was a lot of things that made Acts of God a fascinating read to an 11 year old. It was easy to read, for one thing. It was published by Reader's Digest. It had lots of pictures of interesting things. It had little diagrams of how tornadoes worked and what hurricanes did, and there were facts about earthquakes, which being from New Jersey was completely foreign to me. And there were all these black and white photographs that were simply shocking to me when I was little, like women in big hoop skirts right with their bonnets standing next to 12 foot high snow drifts in Buffalo, New York, or say a tree that had pierced a house from a tornado. Who knew? And a pile of houses that had all washed down river in a great flood in Pennsylvania and gotten stuck against a bridge all stacked up like they were toys. But hands down, my favorite part of Acts of God by Reader's Digest <laughs> were the first-hand stories of the people who had lived through it all. The eyewitness accounts of inundations, conflagrations, calamities, mortalities, inflamities, anything weird that could befall a cloud or a coastline or what you thought was a mountain but was really a volcano. Sure enough, for each one of those, there was someone in a hoop skirt writing a letter to their sister <laughs> that said, I didn't know it then, but it was just the first day of the great mudslides. And I would think, there was a second day? <laughs> this is getting good. <laughs> or there would be a weather diary from some dairy farmer in Oklahoma that would say, June 10th, the wind was unaccountably strong today, and I'd say, oh no. And then frogs fell. It was a most curious sight. <laughs> 1910. And I'd think, oh my god, it's happening! Go inside! <laughs> it was a different time then, for me and them. But I hope the history buffs among you will especially appreciate that feeling when history comes alive, when it feels real to you, when the words of people who've been dead for a hundred years feel alive and real, it feels like opening up a kind of portal. But the portal is you. Like, as long as I had the book open and I was reading about it, they were alive again. It just seemed impossible to me that something so big, like an earthquake or a flood, could affect so many human lives. Uproot so many homes could be the biggest thing that ever happened in the history of this community and then just be forgotten. 
it felt impossible that those stories were so long ago and not today here in Lindenwald, New Jersey with 11-year-old Sarah. And I also felt privileged in a way. It's a strange kind of privilege to be on the other side of history where you know how it all turned out. I knew how it all turned out, but the people in the photographs, I was looking at them and I knew they didn't yet know. They did not have the privilege of Acts of God by Reader's Digest. <laughs> <laughs> they were living it, but I did. And so the book prompted for me a lot of kind of epistemological and philosophical reflection about the passing of time, the nature of consciousness and awareness. Now, I don't know what my parents thought I was doing with this book. <laughs> you know, it was from Reader's Digest or Old Farmer's Almanac. It was not supposed to prompt an existential crisis <laughs> in your children. <laughs> A couple of years after I got this book, the blizzard of 96 hit South Jersey. Is anyone from New Jersey, Philadelphia? Oh, okay, so. The blizzard of 96, three feet of snow fell in one night, and then half an inch of ice. So there was three feet of snow, but you could walk on top of it. Yes, especially if you were little. It was fantastic for me. I didn't have to go to school. And I thought to myself, oh my god, it's happening! <laughs> this was my time! <laughs> Finally! I'm living through it! It was great. We made an, yes, kids, we made an igloo in the front yard and we could use the ice as windows. Yes, I was a part of history. Finally, I would be in volume two! <laughs> Years afterward, whenever a hurricane would come up the East Coast, I would watch out the window, waiting for the neighbor's house to fall down. <laughs> Which is not a thing that ever happens in South Jersey. <laughs> you know, power outages happened a lot more frequently back then. And whenever the lights would go out during a thunderstorm, I would secretly hope against hope that the lights would not come back on, but that this would only be day one. <laughs> of what would later be called the Great Blackout. My grandkids would say, Grandma, you lived through the Great Blackout? And I would say, it was a different time then. <laughs> or whatever I imagined a grown-up would say in that situation, which is more like, huh? shucks. <laughs> Church safe version. <laughs> now I understand that the difference, the difference between excitement and fear is whether or not you're safe. I think as a child I wanted to have important memories. Important memories of important events. The kind that could wind up in a book. But I also wanted to be safely on the other side of it. Safely on the other side of disaster, knowing how it all turned out. I didn't want to live through it. I wanted the memories of having lived through it. Which was what that book, Acts of God, was. It was a collection of memories on the other side. If reading Acts of God made me feel like I had time traveled into the past, I could imagine that growing up would feel like time traveling into the future but in slow motion, at the rate of about one day per day. <laughs> <laughs> and that everything I did would one day be part of the past. Not to alarm you, but speaking as someone who has successfully done this for a number of decades now, that is how it works. And that time that I was reading that book is now in the past, we carry forward with us our memories and our stories from our younger selves. I find memory itself to be a pretty weird phenomenon when I think about it too hard. Unlike most animal species, humans can close our eyes and call into cognition an incredible amount of information about places and things and people that do not exist in front of us at this time in that state. 
It's a kind of altered form of consciousness that we can induce at will. We can recreate the sensation of being somewhere we're not. That's kind of special and fantastic. If you've lost someone you love, you might, especially recently, you might know the feeling of missing them so hard, thinking about them so intently, it feels impossible that you can't just reach out and touch them. It can feel impossible that they're not right there, that they're not anywhere. That feeling is, it can feel like it will break you apart. The incongruity with what you can sense and imagine and the state of the world around you. But let me tell you, so many years ago I had lost a family member and some well-meaning person said to me at the time, he's not really gone. You still have the memories. And at the time, in the depth of my grief, they are so lucky that they had just typed this to me and we're not in the room. So everything I had to say, they did not have to hear. But I wanted to respond. This was when my Uncle Neil had died. Really, he's not really gone. So the next time I get a flat tire, should I shout to the sky, Uncle Neil, come down here. Help me change this. You know, something is substantially lost. Memories can only take you so far. They can't give you a hug. But there is something partially true about the consolation of memories. While it is no replacement for having the actual person, while your loved one might still be gone, you do still have something that oftentimes, if it was a loving relationship, you wouldn't give away. Sometimes if it was not, you wish you could. Memories are not all universally good. And whether or not it's a consolation for loss, I don't know that I would give them up either way. One of my favorite poems now as an adult is the poem The Wanderer, which was written in Anglo-Saxon sometime before the year 975, very long ago. And it's pretty short and pretty boring especially compared to Act of God, which has diagrams <laughs> of tornadoes. But in The Wanderer, a man simply sits and thinks about all the people he's lost. That's basically the entirety of the poem. He remembers the good times, this person is nameless, anonymous, and he laments not having anyone to talk to about it, because all his friends who lived through the good times with him are now gone. No one else remembers except him. He's the last one. That's a real feeling, and that resonated with me. I find it really touching that someone in the year 900 thought that that feeling was so significant and noteworthy that it was worth writing down. And that in the year 2000 and something, it still rings true. I'm at an age now where a couple times a year I find out that someone I used to know has died. From what I understand, that pace only picks up as you get older. And every time I go through the same process of reminiscing and thinking back to when we did know each other. Oh, I remember that year when we met. And sometimes it's a person I haven't talked to in maybe a decade or longer. If you haven't heard the term disenfranchised grief, I think it's an important idea to know, and I think about it often. There are some losses that we tend to grieve in private, just because they're not acknowledged by society. There's no Hallmark card for, you know, the person who sat behind you in middle school, for example. That's a private sadness that sometimes doesn't feel worth mentioning to others. When your spouse dies, people offer condolences as well they should. But what about when your ex-spouse dies? That's more complicated to grieve in public, but that is also a real loss. Or a parent you were estranged from. Or a step-parent. Or a same-sex partner in a closeted relationship. When the newspaper says they are survived by their longtime friend. Or a friend from your youth that no one knew you were such close friends with. Or a lover you had an affair with, but told nobody. That happens. 
The loss of a child, not to death, but to adoption, even voluntary. The loss of family relationships because you yourself were on drugs, in the grips of addiction, or in prison. These are all examples of real losses from which we wind up being disenfranchised, and they are real. In some cases, they can be more complicated to work through than traditional losses. In my work as a chaplain, I've seen the same dynamic happen over and over at deathbeds. The surviving family member, who is most estranged from the dying person, the person who moved away years ago and lost touch, they leave the room to cry because they think that they have no right to their grief. And they don't share their stories of the person's life because they think they have no right to treasure their memories. But you do. You have a right to treasure the sacredness of your memory. I think our individual memories are sacred. They are precious and irreplaceable. I think that each person's memory is but a fraction of the divine consciousness of the universe itself. You've heard the phrase that we are the universe perceiving itself. We are the universe remembering itself as well. When someone experiences one of these disenfranchised griefs, they're left with these sacred, precious memories that they cannot share with anyone, but which are still just as vibrant and real and present and painful. Which is why I can't tell you how healing it can be just to have someone to tell your stories to. Sometimes at my church I, I give people a coffee hour assignment, something like, ask this question of someone. Ask them what their favorite song was when they were a child. Ask them their favorite hiding place in elementary school. We had a special bush in the backyard that was like a little canopy. Or ask them to share just one happy memory from their childhood that they haven't told anyone. And I invite you to be that inquisitive of one another. We often don't get a chance to share those. They just sit with us. Maybe causing us to smile in the grocery store. <coughs> But I remember in 1996, a blizzard hit South Jersey, and we built an igloo. And later, my sister and I would wind up estranged for over a decade. Oh. On that day, though, we used sheets of ice that had hardened on top of the snow to put windows in our igloo, and the inside was glowing blue. Mm -hmm. No one else was little enough to fit in there. No one else has that memory. I can't tell you what it was, what kind of blessing it was to reconnect with her, to have someone to share that memory with. I would like to close repeating our reading from today, from the Bhagavad Gita about Brahman, the ultimate reality of the universe. I am the self that dwells in the heart of every mortal creature. I am the beginning, the lifespan, and the end of all. I am the radiant sun among the life givers. I am the mind. I am consciousness in the living. I am death that snatches all. I am also the source of all that shall be born. I am time without end. I am the sustainer. My face is everywhere. I am the beginning, the middle, and the end in creation. I am the knowledge of things spiritual. I am glory, prosperity, beautiful speech, memory, intelligence, steadfastness, and forgiveness. I am the divine seed of all lives. In this world, nothing animate or inanimate exists without me. I am the strength of the strong. I'm the purity of the good. I'm the knowledge of the knower. There is no limit to my divine manifestations. Whatever in this world is powerful, beautiful, or glorious, that you may know to have come forth 
from a fraction of my power and glory.